maybe for Cincinnati, but I was going to continue this week exploring how we can develop the will to embrace and manifest a living planet story, which recognizes humanity as a beneficial and integrated presence within Earth's biosphere, co-creating a just, sustainable, and thriving world. Do you all remember the series I started mm -hmm. before I left? Weeks ago. <laughs> but then, of course, I saw Hamilton. <laughs> And I felt compelled to switch gears a little bit. I promise there is a connection. I promise. So just be patient. So how many of you have seen Hamilton? And anybody listen to the soundtrack, even if you haven't seen the, seen the play? How many would like to see it? Do it. Yes. <laughs> so after seeing Hamilton and still being just moved by its everything, depth and, and the experience of it, I started researching. You know, when, when you're a minister, you can go online and you can say a name of a movie or a play or whatever and say spiritual points in. Uh -huh. And you find all kinds of information. And there's actually a book out called God and Hamilton, <laughs> written by Kevin Cloud. And it is an amazing book. It's called, as I said, God and Hamilton, Spiritual Themes from the Life of Alexander Hamilton, and it, it just has a lot of richness to it. He poses this question. What is it about our cultural context that has created the soil for this story to take root and grow into such an unprecedented phenomenon? It opened in Bro on Broadway in August of 2015, and it hasn't shown any signs of slowing down yet. It's been running continuously in Chicago since October 2016. And the Sunday matinee that we attended was sold out. We drove four and a half hours one way, paid $250 a seat for partial view tickets, and I would do it again. As Cloud notes, one answer for this phenom status is that it's simply that good. It won 11 Tony Awards in 2016, including the Best Musical, and was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Michelle Obama declared it the best piece of art in any form that I've ever seen in my life. And Lin-Manuel Miranda, the author, composer, who also played the original role of Hamilton, is being described as genius and a modern-day Shakespeare, having intertwined rap and hip-hop with Broadway for the very first time, with fresh, insightful, and imaginative lyrics like rhyming, as you'll see up here, democracy, Socrates, Roxas these, and mediocrities in the song. And that's the closest you'll ever hear me get to rap. <laughs> it was all done in the song nonstop, describing Hamilton's rise to the top after the war. And of course, Hamilton also resonates with our culture because the story intersects with a number of important social issues of our time, such as immigration, gender and racial equality, and diversity. Hamilton was an immigrant from the Caribbean. How many of you even know the story of Hamilton? Very few of us do. I didn't before this, This though. We have some, some folks that are, are more familiar with history. My daughter taught American history, so she had sort of a wealth of, of additional information. But I didn't know that he was an immigrant from the Caribbean. And Miranda calls it the Quinton Seth essential immigrant story of redefining yourself when you come to a new place. How many of us have we talked about that in our COPA meetings, that we've all immigrated in some ways. It may not be from another country to this country, but if we move to a new state, if we move to a new community, we have that experience of reinventing ourselves because we're not known. And it's like we get, we get, get to begin again. The gifts and potential of immigrants is a theme that's woven throughout the play, perhaps most aptly summed up when Hamilton and Lafayette met, meet to join forces for the final battle of the war and they quit immigrants, we get the job done. <laughs> the audience response required Miranda to rewrite the music and put in a couple of beats more of music because the audience response was drowning out the next line. So they got such a response. And we see there's an emotional response to the cultural issues. Central roles are also given to women who declare their equality throughout the production. Celebrating the famous words of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Angelica Schuyler, who becomes Hamilton's sister-in-law and 
intellectual soulmate, we'll say, declares that when she meets Thomas Jefferson, she's going to compel him to include women in the sequel. And Hamilton's wife, Eliza, is rightly portrayed as a strong, intelligent, and kind woman who deeply impacts the Republic right alongside her husband. She lives an additional 50 years past his death and dedicates her life to protecting and promoting his legacy, as well as continuing his fight for issues such as the creation of the Washington Monument, the end of slavery, and her most cherished project, the establishment of the first private orphanage in New York City, and it is still in operation today. Finally, of course, said in our nation's defining era of slavery, questions of race are never far from the surface of Hamilton, with perhaps the most obvious indicator being having the founding fathers all played by actors of color. A casting decision that Cloud suggests turns expectations upside down and challenges the audience to open itself up to new possibilities. David Diggs, who plays Hamilton's friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, in the first act, and returns as Thomas Jefferson, his enemy, in the second act, found participating in this play to be an amazingly uh, powerful experience. He grew up in the tough part of Oakland, but went on to Brown University, and he had this to say. Seeing a black man play Jefferson, or Madison, or Washington when he was a kid in Oakland might have changed his life. Wow. Yeah. But beyond these socially and culturally and politically important issues, as well as the creative genius of the production, there's still something more. Cloud proclaims, this show and the story it tells becomes a moment of spiritual transcendence for the people lucky enough to experience it. He says, the night I saw the show, I found myself unexpectedly drawn into the presence of God. Another reviewer that he quotes offered a similar observation saying, I haven't felt this alive in a show since I don't know when. You had the incredible feeling of when a door opens up and a brand new wind blows through making that subtle reference to the winds of Pentecost, perhaps. Cloud concludes, feeling fully alive, experiencing a new wind blowing through, sounds like the reality and presence of God to me. <laughs> he goes on to describe Hamilton as a thin place. How many of you have heard that, that concept, thin place? It's a reference to the ancient Celtic belief that a veil separates earth to keep us from seeing the reality of heaven and God that is always above and around and beyond and within us. But there are thin places in the veil, they believe, where it becomes translucent and where God becomes almost visible and can definitely be felt and perceived by those who are open and receptive or have eyes to see, as scriptures say. Cloud goes on to explore the copious spiritual themes like grace, faith, forgiveness, surrender, death, redemption, and more present both in Hamilton's actual life and in Miranda's dramatic presentation of it. Themes that establish the fertile context for that Holy Spirit moment to occur, especially as presented through Miranda's masterful, emotional, and dramatic storytelling. I can attest that Hamilton definitely felt like a thin place for me. It was two and a half hours of shared hearts being touched, broken open, and expanded. Perhaps a transcendent experience, where I and the other 1,799 patrons present were blessed with a reminder of God's presence among, among us that can often happen when we have collective experiential and emotional experiences with a group, whether they're people we know or it's even more powerful when it's with strangers. Cloud suggests that art holds a unique power to usher us into such thin places, perhaps because of God's creative nature it awakens us to the wonder and beauty of creation and allows us to glimpse that divine presence that is too often hidden and too often diminished in our busy, worldly lives. But so too does Hamilton's personal story of grace, faith, forgiveness, and redemption. As we continue to learn through our work with COPA, Cloud affirms that stories matter. They have the power to fundamentally change the way we see the world and live our lives. They can inspire us to be the people that God created us to be. Which brings me to the connection, I promise, and a story of my own continuing spiritual evolving. But first, just so you get a little bit of the nature and power of Hamilton, I want to share one of the Hamilton songs that embodies what I think is 
one of these most powerful transcendent spiritual moments. It begins with a line, there are moments that the words don't reach. And it's called Uptown. And just to give you a little bit of background, Hamilton and Eliza are estranged. And it's a long story, but basically I'm just going to share it. It was after he had an affair that broke her heart. But now they're both dealing with the tragic death of their 19-year-old son, Philip. So without saying too much, and frankly, I don't think there's such a thing as spoilers in this show, because the more you know the story, the more you study it, the more you'll get out of it. But nevertheless, this song is about how the power of love, forgiveness, and grace can carry us through the unimaginable aspects of life into redemption. Thank you. 
I can tell you there wasn't a dry eye in the house at the, at the play. And my grandkids in the car will say, put on the one that makes mommy cry. <laughs> I got her down. She said she's now listened to it enough times that usually she can get through it without it. So I listened to it a number of times so I could get back up here and talk. <laughs> so now the connection. We've been exploring how we might establish, as I said, the will, given that we already have the knowledge and technology, to embrace and live a new story in the manifestation about how we engage this planet Earth. A story that redefines humanity's position and role within creation from our current narrative of separation, domination, and exploitation to one of interdependence and interbeing, beneficial cooperation, and collective sustainability. With our understanding of the law of mind action, unity's third basic principle, I think, meaning we co-create our reality through thoughts held in mind, in essence, from the inside out. You can all say that, from the inside, inside out. out. We've been seeking, I've been seeking, to more fully imagine what this new story, this new world would look like, sound like, smell like, taste like, feel like, and perhaps even more importantly, how I, how we would look and believe and act and feel and be in such a new world. So that as we hold that vision, we could then bring it into manifestation, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's sort of been the challenge. But I have to say, I'm not feeling very successful at it. Anybody else struggling <laughs> with that? I mean, I'm aware of all the dire predictions, the necessity for change. I bring my own shopping bags. I carry reusable straws in my purse. I drive a Prius. I eat less beef. <laughs> Yet I still don't see a lot of changes, don't feel very changed. Because I also know that I still drive that Prius almost daily. There's no other way to get from where I live into work. I fly to Cincinnati and other destinations multiple times a year, adding to the whole airline dynamic of that. I order from Amazon, as so delivery trucks are moving, and I continue to live pretty much as I lived before. This is a comic strip that my kids, my grandkids, uh, they read the comics and they read them out loud to us often. And they found this one where the kids are reading the New York Times and they're going, oh my god, you know, the earth is coming to an end and the, the temperatures are rising and we're doomed and the parents are sitting over watching television saying, Come on over here, kids. Dancing with the stars on. We have popcorn. Just sort of trying to distract them. And it says down in the corner, and they immediately cancel their trial subscription to the New York Times. Now, I don't ignore it like that, but I can relate to that looking for distractions because I don't quite know what is mine to do. And we have to realize that our American consciousness is manifesting in an administration that is literally stepping on the gas rather than slowing down or reversing our seeming impending demise. So I'm wondering, how are we going to do this? What kind of world am I leaving my grandkids, or my kids, for that matter? How do I change things? How do I change me? And then I read Cloud's chapter on Hamilton and Grace. And without going into a great deal of detail about Hamilton's life, suffice it to say that his rise to being one of the most influential founding fathers from his tragic beginnings of a poor kid in the West Indies is basically miraculous. In short, Hamilton's life is built on a foundation of grace. But the point of the chapter is that, in fact, all of our lives are built on the foundation of God's grace, the inherent design by us for good, this ever-expanding, ever-unfolding, upward-progressive movement of life. But just like Hamilton, we struggle with recognizing and accepting this race, partially because the idea of not being in control or worse, surrendering our control is an anathema to our human egos. But also because, as Cloud observes, our imagination simply isn't big enough to grasp the full power of God's grace. And that's when I realized that my, our attempts to imagine a new world story in order to manifest a new reality from seemingly the inside out is actually still focused on the outer form and results and how we're going to make that happen. Instead of being focused on what is truly the inner source of our beingness, 
In essence, to change our outer world, we need to be changed ourselves. Not just change our vision of the outer world, but be changed at depth ourselves. And note that it's about needing to be changed, not about changing ourselves, because it involves surrender. Which is why it's so difficult, or maybe even impossible, to imagine a different story, a different world. We're still functioning from the same consciousness that created and sustains that old story. Our true work, then, is to surrender into God's grace. Now, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to leave it to God to fix the mess that we create. But rather, we're being called to imagine and open ourselves to a power and a wisdom that is greater than we are greater than we can even imagine, trusting that the answers we seek will be provided if we will stop and listen. Ed Rabel, one of Unity's earliest metaphysics writers and teachers, put it this way. When we are de depending entirely upon God's grace, and I add this, rather than our own abilities, the answer to every prayer is something far greater than our present state of consciousness could ever have conceived. And I can tell you that it works. As I've opened myself to this epiphany, articles, books, insights that all support this shift and expansion in consciousness as the answer keeps appearing. What better way to embrace the coming miracle of Easter than to surrender into God's grace, willing to be transformed and awaken into new life? I hope you'll join me over the next couple weeks as I expand these concepts and we awaken on Easter Sunday. <coughs> Namaste. Namaste. that rhythm of the universe. I'm going to read this morning from what's often called Romero's Prayer, Prophets of a Future Not Our Own. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us, 
No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. It enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. And so as we relax into this awareness of being part of the whole, but not the whole, let us take a moment to listen. Perhaps our most important task, to listen for God's guidance in the silence. And so even as we humble ourselves into the truth of our limited time and space in this lifetime, we're also called to have the imagination to realize our true potential as Christ beings. So coming from that place of humility, we open ourselves to be used by God to express the fullness of God in the world. And we are blessed in the journey. So we give thanks for these opportunities to listen. We commit ourselves to listening more so that we can be that presence and power in the world. So with grateful hearts, we say thank you, God. And when you're ready, Open your eyes. 